In this lecture, we're going to begin a discussion of the functionality doctrine, a really fundamental exclusion of subject matter eligible for trademark protection. And I think it's interesting to note that the functionality doctrine can be seen as performing two kinds of channeling functions. One channeling function concerns the law within trademark doctrine as a whole. And so what goes on in the functionality doctrine has consequences in other areas of trademark law. And we've talked about this a little bit already. The functionality bar creates room for more kinds of things to be trademarks. It, in effect, lowers the distinctiveness bar. And it does this because it gives courts some comfort that they can let some things into the trademark universe, assured that if they're in and they turn out to be functional, if they turn out to be the kinds of things for which protection would interfere with competition, the courts can then invoke the functionality doctrine to exclude particular trademarks. So you could imagine a world in which the functionality doctrine didn't exist, and that might make courts more reluctant in cases like two pesos to open the door to broadly eligible trade dress protection, saying that certain kinds of trade dress can be treated as inherently distinctive. Likewise, in Walmart, we see a court, the Supreme Court expressing the concern from the other direction, saying that we are, we want to be cautious about letting product design be protected as trade dress for fear that the functionality doctrine is not going to be an adequate screen at an early stage of litigation, not the kind of thing that you can easily apply on summary judgment in a piece of litigation that is primarily designed to thwart competition. And so in those situations, we want to make it more difficult for, for product design to get trademark protection. Ergo, we only allow protection for product design upon a showing of secondary meaning. In addition to having a channeling of doctrines within trademark law, the functionality doctrine also exerts a channeling force in intellectual property law in general. And so one of the things the functionality doctrine does is it acts as a way of policing the barrier between trademark law and patent law by assuring that the kinds of things that ought to be the subject matter of patent protection, as you see in a case like traffics, are protected by patents. And you don't use trademark law as a backdoor way of extending a patent after it has expired. Now, of course, overlaps are still possible. The Supreme Court in traffics doesn't rule out the possibility that something that was the subject of patent protection could still get trademark protection after patent expiration, but it makes it much more difficult and less likely that that sort Sort of thing is going to occur. So the functionality doctrine, like so much in trademark law, has, it has its origins in the common law and is now codified in various places in the Lanham Act. Section 2E5 prevents the registration of functional marks. Section 33B8 makes functionality a defense to an infringement claim. Section 43A3 says that if there's an action for an infringement of an unregistered trade dress, the plaintiff has the burden of showing that the dress in question is not functional. Now, interestingly, the Lanham Act did not mention or refer to the functionality doctrine at all until the 1990s. There was no codification. And what happened before then? Well, there was a certain amount of gap filling by the courts. There was, you know, there actually, you can find an opinion out there that says, you know, we're not going to apply the doctrine to registered marks, but other courts were assuming that Congress wouldn't eliminate a doctrine so fundamental to trademark law without being explicit. And so that's that issue of the common law backdrop that we've talked about in earlier lectures. Nonetheless, the issue came to a head, you know, perhaps because of the expansion in trade dress law recognized by the Supreme Court in the two pesos case. Now, what exactly is functional matter? And here we have an interesting problem that the Lanham Act does not actually give us a definition. It does not give the courts a standard for assessing when subject matter claimed as a trademark is actually functional. So courts muddle along with this sort of thing. And an important case in the development of the doctrine is a case called In Re Morton Norwich Products Incorporated, where the court was considering whether a spray bottle configuration was functional. And in that case, the court recognizes that when we're dealing with functionality, there is a doctrinal tension. On the one hand, we want to ensure that 
people in the marketplace have the ability to compete. At the same time, we want there to be the ability to distinguish products when a product design is performing a trademark function. Now, of course, you could take the, take the view, and I'm very sympathetic to this view, that the game isn't worth the candle and that the way you preserve competition is just by not allowing product design to be trademarked in the first place, you know, to go even beyond what the Walmart court, court does and just say, no, it's just, it's just off limits, off the table, because the danger to competition is so strong by allowing trademark. But of course, that's not what the law does. The law takes the view that says, okay, on the one hand, we want to be solicitous of competition, but on the other hand, if there is not a danger to competition, we want distinctive product design to be protected, and then with a Walmart proviso that upon a showing of secondary meaning. In a more Norwich, which, which takes place before Walmart, is trying to grapple with those two perspectives. And this question of, well, do we measure the functionality of the object, in which case, you know, it's always gonna be functional, or it's particular design. The court makes this distinction between so-called de facto and de jure functionality. It, yes, the thing may be de facto functional, it's the kind of thing that works to serve a purpose, but is it the particular design that is making it so, I mean, the design that is claimed as the trademark such that we want to call it de jure functional. The issue is of whether the design has a utilitarian purpose and not the thing itself. A dish always functions as a dish and has its utility, but it is the appearance of the dish which is important, and that's in the words of the court. Many configurations are functional in the layperson sense without necessarily being legally functional. So you can imagine that in the context of like spray bottle designs. You can imagine any number of shapes for a spray bottle design, some of which have design features that directly affect the usability of the product, and others that maybe are contrary to the usability of the product, and you know, they're therefore giving us assurances that there's not a functionality problem. And then we have various you know, things, things in between, and that can be a hard thing to adjudicate depending on the circumstances. Now, I, I made a reference to this you know, de jure, de facto distinction. It's not something that the trademark office uses anymore in its, in its um, manual of examining procedures, but the underlying principle still matters and is recognized by the courts. And you'll see it come, you know, be, be alluded to, not in so many words, in the traffics case that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So what exactly makes something utilitarian. The, Norwich, the, the Morton Norwich case gives us a number of factors that courts still make use of today. Unfortunately, in my mind, given this development of precedent after the fact, but that's neither here nor there. So the Morton Norwich factors is the feature of the subject of a utility patent. If it is or was, that's evidence of functionality insofar as utility patents are given for things that have utilitarian purposes. Does the trademark holder or did the trademark holder tout the utilitarian advantages of the design in its advertising? You know, a good sign of functionality. Um, does the design result from a comparatively simple or cheap method of manufacture? The idea there being that if it does, that's the kind of thing that's going to lower the price and therefore make it an attractive thing from the perspective of competitors in the marketplace. And are there alternatives available? And this is the one that I think causes the most mischief today, given what the Supreme Court says in the traffics case. And this general idea that, of course, there's always going to be alternative designs, but if something is a useful design, people should still be able to compete by using it. Nonetheless, one of the factors more Norwich considers is availability of alternatives, and that lives on in the circuits that have adapted some version of those factors in assessing functionality.